Hey everybody, hope you had a great weekend. Um, what we're gonna do today is finish up with the reproduction section uh, of our notes. <clears throat> so, uh, so far in this unit, we, we began by talking about meiosis, the cell division that produces gametes. We went on to talk about human reproductive systems and the um, organs and structures that are part of the male and female reproductive system. What we're going to be doing uh, in this set of notes is to talk a little bit about um, development, fertilization and development in uh, several types of organisms. Uh, and then we'll end by focusing primarily on, on human um, fertilization development um, and birth. So we're talking about organisms here that reproduce sexually. Okay. And so in order for sexual reproduction to take place in, in various organisms, um, fertilization is necessary. And so when we talk about fertilization, we're talking about the combination of the male and female gametes. Okay. Um, and that process produces a cell. So we know that these gametes have um, half the number of chromosomes as normal body cells. They're haploid cells. So a, a male reproductive cell contains half of the chromosomes. The female reproductive cell contains half of the chromosomes. In fertilization, they combine, and then they produce a cell that's called the zygote. And because the zygote is created by two haploid cells, it itself is a diploid cell. It has chromosomes that are in pairs, homologous pairs, and the zygote has the full complement of chromosomes. So for example, if we're talking about uh, human reproduction, the sperm cells carrying 23 chromosomes, the egg cells carrying 23 chromosomes. After fertilization, they combine and they form a zygote, which contains 46 chromosomes. After fertilization has taken place, um, then the process of cell division starts. But now, cell division is taking place through the process of mitosis. Remember, it's mitosis which is responsible for growth of an organism, increase in size of an organism. Um, so after, if we look down here at this diagram, we have the haploid sperm, haploid egg combining chromosomes in the zygote come from both parents. That initial cell, the zygote, then goes through mitosis and it produces two cells. And then those two cells go through mitosis to produce four cells and eight cells. And this process continues. Okay, uh, That process is called cleavage. The um, cleave meaning sort of to divide in two. And so those first um, rapid uh, cell divisions is called cleavage, and it forms a little cluster of cells, a little solid ball of cells called the blast, called the marula. Okay, um, it then starts to uh, form a hollow ball of cells that's called the blastula, and those cells are what we call undifferentiated cells. So, each of these cells that you see here in the blastula are identical to each other. They have the same sets of chromosomes, same genetic information, and they have not yet differentiated. Okay? Differentiation is a process when cells start to take on a specific role, a specific job. Okay? And that process takes place um, early on in the embryonic development. Um, what happens is this hollow ball of cells called the blastula starts to form this indentation. Okay, it's called the gastrula. Okay, and once this happens, then the cells start to differentiate. They start to take on a specific role. Okay, and they start to form what's called these three germ layers the endoderm, okay, and the ectoderm, and the mesoderm. Okay, and you can see in this final diagram, you're starting to see they've been sort of color coded so that. Um, the different germ layers are colored differently, and these cells will take on a different function. They'll become different parts of the organism as development continues. 
these cells. So sometimes you might hear this term embryonic stem cells. Okay. And that's what these cells are. These are embryonic cells and they're called stem cells. Okay. They're another term is pluripotent stem cells. These are cells that could go on and develop into many different types of cells and tissues in the organism. Now, as we talk about different organisms um, and their adaptations to reproduction, okay, there's different um, means of both fertilization and development. So there are um, some organisms which reproduce through what we call external fertilization. What this means is um, the sperm and egg cell meet outside of the organism's body, typically in the water. Okay, uh, So examples of fish, amphibians, reproduce using external fertilization. Okay, um, In fish, for example, when fish spawn, the male and female fish release their reproductive cells, the sperm and egg cells, in the water okay? um, during um, spawning and sperm cells reach the egg cells, fertilize them, and then those fertilized eggs, those tiny little embryos, will then go on and develop also in, in the water externally outside of the body. Okay. So typically these um, organisms re reproduce through external development. Uh, the eggs are typically pretty small. Um, they, they don't typically have a shell often they're covered in sort of this jelly-like material. You see here, these are frog eggs, and you can see each one of these little cells would be an embryo that's growing, okay, covered in this sort of jelly-like material. And that helps keep the egg mass together, uh, help increase the levels of fertilization when the organism's reproducing. Now, what you're gonna see is typically um, organisms that reproduce through external fertilization development produce large numbers of eggs. Okay. And part of the reason is because there's relatively low survival rates for those eggs. Because there's no um, protection from the organism, they're just laid in the water and are there to develop. Um, often they're preyed upon. Often they don't get the nutrients that they need or the oxygen and so forth. Or um, they might wash away. Different weather conditions may result in them not um, developing properly. So many times these Organisms produce many eggs, produce many offspring, um, and generally a smaller percentage will survive. Um, and because they are externally developing, they need a source of energy. And so typically they have um, a yolk in the egg, which provides them with the materials that the growing embryo will use for energy. Water, oxygen can diffuse in and out of the egg through, that, um, through the membrane. Other organisms reprodu reproduce on land, like reptiles and birds, uh, they typically have what we call internal fertilization, meaning um, the male deposits sperm cells into the female's body, where they then fertilize the egg. But then after fertilization, that developing embryo will go on and actually develop outside of the body. So they have internal fertilization, but external development. Okay. The eggs, which are laid um, by the organism, are sort of a structure that contains within it um, fluids, nutrients, everything that the growing and developing embryo needs to survive. So. Organisms that reproduce uh, using external embryonic development are the things that lay eggs. Some insects, reptiles, birds, and even a couple primitive mammals use eggs for external development. Again, the energy for these developing embryos to use is stored inside of the egg uh, as yolk. There's protective shell, okay, um, which helps reduce the loss of water because again these are laid on land so it would be um, easy for them to sort of dehydrate and dry out but they typically have a waterproof 
um, layer which keeps fluids in. Um, and also the developing embryo itself is uh, held within a sac called the amnion that's filled with fluid. So basically an egg is like a tiny little container uh, with a watery environment for the embryo to develop. Okay. And these um, waterproof eggs were an important uh, feature that had to evolve in order for these big groups of animals to be adapted to life on land permanently. You know, um, fish and amphibians return to the water for reproduction because they have external um, development without a waterproof egg. Um, and so the development of having this waterproof egg allowed reptiles and birds to live permanently on land and not have to return to the water for um, reproduction. So this gets back to a little bit um, the reproduction and development. Um, so if we look at under the microscope what the cells look like as they are growing. So what we'd have in this first stage, this would be a zygote. This is a fertilized egg cell. Okay? It's a single cell. It has chromosomes from both mother and father. And it goes through that series of cell divisions that we call cleavage into two cells and four cells and eight cells and so forth. We see the beginning of that um, gastralization where that gastral, that internal um, fold is forming. Okay, now That's eventually going to turn into the inside of the digestive tract, the mouth all the way out to the anus. <clears throat> And then the different layers of cells that are developing during this time as cells are differentiating. The ectoderm is the outermost layer okay, in the developing embryo. And the ectoderm uh, will form eventually, those cells will form the, the epidermis and will also form the nervous system. The mesoderm, that middle layer of cells, eventually will become part of the spinal cord, mus muscle cells, the kidneys, red blood cells, other organs. And then the interior endoderm cells would become things like pancreas cells and thyroid and lung cells. So each layer will develop into specific organs in the mature organism. So I mentioned earlier, those initial cells before differentiation are called stem cells. These are cells that basically have the ability to give rise to other types of cells. And so stem cells are an important um, type of cell because they have the ability to eventually differentiate and become many types of um, cells. So uh, an Pluripotent stem cell can develop into nervous tissue, can develop into epithelial tissue, skin cells can develop into um, cardiac tissue. So they're sort of uh, general purpose cells. And so one um, current area of research is how, how can scientists and doctors use these stem cells um, to treat various diseases, okay? Um, could we use these stem cells to help um, repair tissue that has degenerated? Can we use it to replace disease cells, cells that are breaking down? And so um, using these cells is a, a up and coming um, area of research and uh, one that you'll probably hear a lot about as you go through college and into your careers. Um, it used to be that these stem cells could only be um, found in embryos. And so any research being done um, used cells from embryos. Okay. Um, but since then, in the last, I don't know, maybe decade or so, we now, scientists, have ways of taking differentiated cells, for example, fat cells, and treating those cells and basically turning them back into stem cells which can then be um, caused to differentiate into different types of tissue for medical treatments. So it's an interesting area of study. Okay. Basically, these cells get reprogrammed from um, 
a differentiated form into an undifferentiated form, and then they can be transformed into other types of tissues. And I'll post a video that talks a little bit about that because they're kind of interesting. So let's talk a little bit more about internal development. So the organisms I just was mentioning, um, amphibians and birds, have external embryonic development inside of an egg. But we're focusing here on um, mammals. Mammals have internal embryonic development. So fertilization takes place in the female's body. But then the developing embryo is also retained inside of the female body where it completes its development until birth. That's how most mammals reproduce. There are some exceptions. Down at the bottom of your slide, you see monotremes. Monotremes are egg-laying mammals. Um, there's only a couple types of monotremes. Okay, the um, spiny anteater and the platypus. They actually lay eggs, sort of like birds do. Um, the other two groups of mammals are marsupial mammals and placental mammals. We'll briefly mention marsupial mammals. They have internal fertilization, they have internal development, but they give birth to very immature young. Okay, the young of marsupials are almost in a, a fetal state. Marsupial mammals don't have a placenta. The mother does not supply material to the developing embryo in the form of blood. They have a, a yolk, which provides them with energy for their initial development. And then the mother gives birth to a very immature embryo, which then crawls into a pouch in the mother and that's where the mammary glands are located and then that marsupial mammal will stay in that pouch sort of completing its development nursing um, using milk from the mammary glands for energy and then eventually when it's ready to become independent it emerges from the pouch and then leads an independent life so examples of marsupial mammals include things like koalas and kangaroos in our area opossums if you ever see opossums uh, they're also marsupial mammals but we'll focus on the placental mammals placental mammals uh, again have internal fertilization and internal development the embryo and fetus develops inside of the female uterus typically uh, placental mammals have very small eggs almost microscopic with very little yolk um, but once that um, egg is fertilized, uh, it implants into the wall of the uterus. So the uterine lining, as we learned in our last set of notes, um, contains blood vessels and thickened tissue that will provide um, an area for that embryo to implant. And once the embryo uh, implants into that um, wall of the uterus, a, a structure called the placenta will form. Okay. The placenta is an organ that has a um, tissue from both the mother and from the embryo. Okay. And the placenta is um, rich in blood vessels from the mother and from the embryo. And this is where materials are exchanged between the mother's blood and the embryo's blood. It's important to know, because it's a common misconception, that the mother's blood does not actually go into the embryo. Okay, so in the placenta, the, the blood vessels from the mother are sort of right next to the blood vessels from the embryo. The capillaries are right next to each other. So in those capillaries, materials can move back and forth through diffusion, but the blood doesn't actually mix. So in that placenta, oxygen that's in the mother's blood can diffuse into the blood of the embryo to provide oxygen. Nutrients that are in the mother's blood diffuse into the blood of the embryo, providing those nutrients that are needed. At the same time, waste products from the embryo, carbon dioxide and nitrogen waste, can diffuse in the opposite direction. There are high levels in the embryo's blood, they diffuse into the mother's blood, and she can then excrete those materials by exhaling and by using her kidneys. So the placenta is where that exchange of materials between the 
embryo and fetus and the mother take place. The umbilical cord is the, the connection between the embryo and the placenta. It's basically a tube that has blood vessels that carry blood back and forth from the from the embryo to the placenta and vice versa. Uh, here are the monotremes. Okay, you see the uh, duck-billed platypus. It lays these tiny little eggs. Okay, so it's a unique sort of mammal in that it doesn't give live birth. It doesn't have internal development. It lays eggs. This is the spiny anteater, the echidna. Uh, and again, they're the other example of monotremes, egg-laying mammals. Marsupials, things that I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, here are the opossums. They live in our area. I see them all the time, especially as roadkill. Uh, but again, they give birth to a very, very immature young, which finishes its development in the mother's pouch. And then the koala. I'll try to post this video. It shows marsupial um, birth and development. It's kind of neat, neat to see. And then we have the placental mammals. This is a human placenta, what it looks like. So this placenta, you can see very rich in blood vessels connected here to the umbilical cord. It's attached to the wall of the uterus. Okay, the, the uterus isn't shown here, but it's attached to the wall of the uterus. Blood from the placenta is brought through the umbilical cord, enters into the developing fetus, okay? through the abdomen, and that's where the blood supply connects to the fetal blood. Uh, here's what the umbilical cord looks like um, just after birth. After uh, a child is born, the umbilical cord is cut and clamped. Eventually it um, heals, and that's what the belly button is, where the umbilical cord of a person uh, once emerged and connected it to the placenta. Here's a diagram that shows sort of what embryonic um, development looks like. We have, again, this would be the early stage of the embryo. This is the wall of the uterus. <coughs> the placenta has formed, contains tissue from the mother, also tissue from the embryo. We see those blood vessels, those capillaries next to each other. And so here is where the exchange of materials between mother and embryo happens. They move through the umbilical cord, which is just partially developed at this point in development, and provide the embryo with the materials that it needs to develop. There is a yolk sac early on in development, which provides the initial energy for the embryo to grow. It's also, the embryo is surrounded by this sac, this amniotic sac, which contains amniotic fluid, sort of cushioning the embryo and fetus as it grows. So let's talk specifically about human reproduction. Let me move myself off this egg cell. Um, so we'll talk specifically about human reproduction and human fertilization. So in um, humans, fertilization takes place, um, typically it has to be within about 24 hours of ovulation. So if we think back to the reproductive cycle, we know that about halfway through a woman's reproductive cycle, ovulation takes place. She will release an egg cell from an ovary, will begin traveling through the oviduct or fallopian tube, and as that egg is in the fallopian tube, that is the time when it can be fertilized by a sperm cell. So if a woman is ovulated and has sex in the time around ovulation, those sperm cells can make their way um, from the vagina through the cervix into the uterus and eventually into the oviduct where they can reach the egg. And that's in the upper oviduct. Only a single sperm cell can actually penetrate and contribute its chromosomes to the zygote. Okay. Um, and there are adaptations that the um, 
a layer around the egg. As soon as a single sperm cell penetrates into the egg, that layer immediately changes to become impermeable to other sperm cells. And that's what allows for a single sperm cell to fertilize the egg cell. Because obviously if multiple sperm cells were to fertilize a single egg cell, we would have a problem with the number of chromosomes. If the egg cell is not fertilized, okay, after about 24 hours, it sort of disintegrates and is shed out of the woman's body during the menstrual period. If it is fertilized in the oviduct, that's when cleavage begins, cell division begins. This is mitosis of the embryo. So the first cell is called the zygote. Once it starts to go through cleavage and divide, we call it an embryo. As that embryo is traveling down the fallopian tube, okay, takes, takes several days, um, it's dividing the entire time. Okay, it's forming that marula, that ball of cells, that hollow ball. Then it's indenting and gastrulating to form um, the layers of cells. And eventually it reaches the uterus. It attaches to the wall of the uterus, which has been thickened with the blood vessels and tissue due to the hormones of the menstrual cycle. And then it attaches and several layers start to form. Okay. These layers actually don't become part of the embryo, but they're part of the supporting tissue. So one layer is the chorion that becomes the placenta and sort of grows into the wall of the uterus. And again, this is where diffusion takes place. It's also the amnion, the sac which the embryo is going to um, develop inside of. It's filled with fluid, it sort of acts as a shock absorber for the embryo. There's a small yolk sac to provide the energy needed to make the initial blood cells until certain organs mature. And then the umbilical cord, which connects the embryo to the placenta. And so um, sometimes uh, if a, a couple wants to have a child, if a woman wants to have a child, um, and is not able to do so for some reason, um, typically, there are some different types of reproductive technology that are sometimes used for uh, reproduction. One of those is called in vitro fertilization. Um, in vitro fertilization is when a doctor takes uh, an egg cell from the mother's ovary, takes sperm cells from um, a father, and actually fertilizes the egg outside of the body in a petri dish, basically. And that embryo is allowed to um, go through um, cleavage and divide a few times until it forms a small embryo. And then the doctor can take that embryo, implant it back into the mother and where it will um, implant in the uterus and um, form an embryo and grow into a fetus and eventually a, a child. That's in vitro fertilization. Um, another treatment is sometimes used called artificial insemination. That's when actually sperm cells from a male are um, inserted into the female vagina and then fertilization can take place. Those are a couple types of ways that alternative ways that a woman can become pregnant. Um, we use various terms when we're talking about um, development and birth, and I've been using these terms a little bit, but haven't really defined them yet. So the stages before a woman is pregnant are called the prenatal stages. Then once fertilization has taken place, we have a zygote, that single fertilized egg cell. After that zygote divides, we call it an embryo up until eight weeks. After eight weeks, we call it a fetus until birth happens, and then birth begins the postnatal time. In humans, the gestational time, the time it takes to go from fertilization to birth is typically about 40 weeks, plus or minus two weeks, um, and that's a typical gestational period. And as a woman is pregnant, um, there are um, different things that can affect the fetus as it's growing and developing. 
um, certain substances which can cause disease or abnormalities in the offspring are called teratogens. Things um, like alcohol, drugs, certain viruses, certain chemicals in, um, in um, smoking um, can affect the embryo especially in the earliest stages. So in the earliest stages of development are when major organs and organ systems are developing. And so any um, damaging substance that the mother is ingesting can have serious effects on the child. Okay, And so um, it's important that when a woman becomes pregnant, she avoids those, those substances. Uh, fluid from the amnion can be sampled using a, a sort of long needle, can be used to test for chromosome abnormalities, um, can be used um, to determine the um, sex of the child and so forth. Sonograms are also used to sort of get a picture of uh, the offspring, the embryo inside to make sure uh, everything's looking healthy, to see the heartbeat and so forth. It's basically a, an image of the fetus using sound waves. And um, when a woman is pregnant, it um, is possible that the, the embryo, the fetus, does not complete development. Uh, about 10 to 20% of pregnancies end in a miscarriage when um, the embryo can't survive independently. Um, so it's actually quite common. If we look at the different stages here of embryonic development, uh, we can see this is this is not all of development, but we can see from the very first zygote stage up until um, these various stages. This is at about um, two months. Um, we see embryo uh, develop significantly, and by that time, okay, um, most major organs are formed uh, during these stages, and then the rest of the development is the the maturing of those uh, organs and organ systems and eventually the um, eventually birth after a period of 40 weeks. <clears throat> uh, when that time comes for birth, we call that labor and delivery. Um, so the term labor is um, when contractions of the uterus um, start to move the fetus um, through the cervix and eventually um, through the vagina. So if you've had relatives that were pregnant or parents or you know, seeing in movies that um, when a woman is close to her due date, um, at some point she will start to feel these contractions. And it's like any muscle in the body. The, the uterus is a muscle, sort of a hollow muscle and uterine contractions are when that muscle involuntarily contracts and sort of um, almost spasms. And um, that process leads to the beginning of labor. And at the beginning, those, those um, contractions are relatively mild and they happen every, you know, 15 minutes or so. But as labor moves along and, and progresses, those contractions start to um, become more intense. The contractions start to get closer together. Um, and what's happening during this time of uterine contractions is the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus, is, um, is dilating. It's opening up and it's thinning out to allow the fetus to pass through it. Um, and so those contractions continue, get closer together, um, the, the cervix dilates. Uh, eventually, at some point, typically the amniotic sac um, ruptures. And if you've heard of people talking about their um, water breaking, that's what this means. Um, means that the amniotic sac is ruptured and that fluid inside of the amniotic sac usually um, comes out through the vagina. And that's a sign that a woman is going into labor or is moving along through labor. Um, there are different things doctors can do to sort of speed along if, if labor is not happening um, quickly enough or if um, the doctors want to speed things along there are medications that they can administer 
um, which stimulate those contractions and, and make it make labor happen more quickly eventually as those contractions move the fetus down through the cervix we uh, or not we I shouldn't say uh, the woman um, gets into the delivery portion of the birth and delivery is when the woman at um, pushes the baby through the cervix through the vagina and eventually um, out of her body and then the fetus has been born and so um, after the fetus is born um, the placenta so we see here the initial stages and we see the beginning of um, delivery where the woman would be pushing the fetus out um, and after the fetus is born the placenta that's inside of the uterus breaks away from the wall of the uterus and the woman then delivers the placenta afterwards that the placenta comes out of the woman's body after the fetus does sometimes uh, there are complications with a vaginal birth um, could be that the fetus is under distress and needs to be um, delivered more quickly um, and that's when a doctor might do a c-section cesarean section and basically a cesarean section is when uh, a doctor removes the fetus uh, through an incision in the abdomen so um, in, instead of a vaginal birth a doctor makes an incision through the abdomen wall through the muscle through the uterus and then removes the fetus through that incision rather than the typical vaginal birth a uh, cesarean section usually has a longer recovery period for the mother and is um, uh, more um, difficult uh, post-birth recovery because all that muscle needs to heal there's been surgery and so it takes a little bit longer uh, I'll post these videos as well. They just show animations of a C-section vaginal birth. Now there's just a couple things, last things to mention. Um, we know that um, twins are um, sometimes born. And we'll talk about the, the reason for the different types of twins. So um, the the categories of twins are fraternal and identical fraternal twins are twins um, which basically are no more similar than brothers and sisters or siblings okay. um, they can be different sexes um, and fraternal twins form when um, sometimes a woman will release more than one egg cell during an ovulation okay it could release two egg cells if both of those egg cells then are fertilized by two different sperm cells they each can develop into an embryo and implant and develop and be born but because they arose from two different egg cells and two different sperm cells they um, are different genetically so um, just like brothers and sisters are different genetically even though they came from the same parents fraternal twins are no more similar than any other sibling but identical twins form when instead a single egg cell is fertilized by a single sperm cell and early on during the embryonic stages that zyte that um, embryo splits for some reason during that cleavage and so those cells groups of cells that have split each can then grow and develop into their own offspring but again these came from a single egg and a single sperm cell they have the exact same chromosomes. These are genetically identical twins. They're always going to have the same sex. Okay, they're going to look identical. So um, identical twins form from a single embryo that splits at some point during development. There are times when um, that happens quite late in the embryonic development and actually can lead to um, twins that are conjoined, that are um, connected uh, in some way and share some of their tissue together. And depending on where that connection is and how much is shared and which organs are shared, they may be able to be separated or they may not be able to if they contain too many organs in common. Um, finally, in um, 
in birth control. So when um, a woman does not want to um, become pregnant, uh, there are various means of accomplishing birth control. And you probably talked about some of these in health. Uh, obviously, the, the um, most successful method of not uh, getting pregnant is not having sex. That's abstention. Um, sometimes women try to time when they have sex with when they're ovulating. Uh, if a woman is um, not ovulating, then she can't become pregnant. So um, that's another um, way of trying to avoid pregnancy. There's different hormones that a woman can take um, through a pill form, okay, oral contraceptives or the pill. Um, there are injectable um, hormone means of birth controls as well uh, that are longer or lasting. There's patches of hormones um, that a woman can use. There are also barriers to fertilization. Things like a condom on a man can prevent sperm cells from reaching the egg cell. Um, or a diaphragm, which is a device a woman can use to prevent sperm cells from getting to the egg cells. There's chemicals such as spermicides, which kill sperm cells. Uh, if you've heard of an IUD, an intrauterine device, is a device that's implanted into the uterus of a woman um, that prevents implantation, prevents um, sperm cells from reaching the egg cell. It's a sort of long-lasting means of birth control. Or there's also permanent methods of birth control, such as tubal ligation or vasectomy in a man that um, we mentioned when we were talking about male and female reproductive systems. Uh, and the important thing also to know is that, you know, these means of birth control prevent pregnancy, but um, they don't all prevent from the transmission of uh, disease as well. So sexually transmitted diseases um, can still be transmitted using most of these um, methods of birth control. And we can look at sort of, you know, the effectiveness of those um, types of birth control from the least effective so it says trying to time sex, um, the condoms, okay, the pill. Okay, so you can see these rates here, these percentages, are the percent of um, failure. So if uh, a woman is trying to time sex with her reproductive cycle, about 24% of the time that is ineffective. So it's not very effective. Condoms, 18% pill, 9%, um, IUDs, okay, uh, less than 1%. Um, even, even sterilization methods like a tubal ligation or a vasectomy, um, they do have a very small likelihood that they do not um, work properly and a woman can get pregnant even using those what we think of as more permanent methods. All right, so um, that is the end of our notes in this section on reproduction. Um, we have a couple activities that you're going to be doing, and we'll review and we'll have a quiz on what we've done so far. Um, but uh, that's where we'll end things for, for today.